that we can start off completely over. Well, in fact, we can't. We cannot because of our knowledge, because of our learning, and because of our expectations. Those are things that are stuck inside of our heads, that are embedded in, in us, and because we operate from the existing set of institutions. And so I want to talk tonight about these institutions, and we also operate under the laws of economics. So there's certain things that are going to bring the limits here. So, first of all, though, why space economics? It seems like, like maybe it's sort of a cute area, or is it important? And I'm going to start out and, and tell a story. I don't have a picture to go with. Um, my grandmother one day picked up a newspaper and she read in it that men had flown through the air in a powered machine for the first time in history. Some years later, my grandmother picked up a newspaper and read in it that men had walked on the moon for the first time in history. Now those are pretty dramatic changes. Uh, but I think that the scale of changes is going to accelerate, not slow down. And so, uh, space economics, there's already a literature in this, I forget how to refer to this, that already, that already exists, um, some of these uh, outer space law, economics and things, um, and uh, what the heck is it? So this is what we need to get into. And I'm gonna, I've got a, another slide here, which is a, uh, a horrible, it's a great quote, it's a horrible slide. Um, <laughs> you're not supposed to put, so instead of having you read that, I'll try to read it to you, which might even be a worse thing to do, but there are two ways to predict the progress of technology. One way is economic forecasting, the other way is science fiction. Economic forecasting makes predictions by extrapolating curves of the growth from the past into the future. Science fiction makes a wild guess and leaves judgment to the reader. Uh, economic forecasting is useful for predicting up, up to the future, up to about 10 years ahead, but beyond 10 years, it rapidly becomes meaningless. Beyond 10 years, the quantitative changes which the forecast assesses are usually sidetracked or made irrelevant by qualitative changes in the rules of the game. For the future beyond 10 years ahead, science fiction is a more useful guide than forecasting. But science fiction does not pretend to predict. It tells us only what might happen, not what will happen. It deals in possibilities, not probabilities. And the most important developments of the future are usually missed by both the forecasters and by the science fiction writers. Economic forecasting misses the future because it has too short a range. Fiction because it misses the future because it has too little imagination. This is a quote from the great physicist Freeman Dyson. And what I'm hoping to do tonight is to build a middle ground between forecasting and science fiction. That middle ground is, I call it economic theory. And it's what Ludwig von Mises called praxeological theory. We'll see if we can do that. What I'm going to be doing is using positive economics to try to explain things that I think will happen. And where I'm not sure, I think I can at least rule out an event or two which are, which are less likely, unlikely events. But what are we talking about here? Let's first talk a little bit about the space economy um, this is actually, I think, the same slide that I had up when I did the, uh, it was a presentation for the Hamilton Society on, on uh, militariz militarization of space. But this is the space economy. And it's something that is real. Uh, to, to, uh, in 2017, it was $300 billion, so it's pretty good size. 5% annual growth rate, it's been doing that for, for the previous decade. Uh, over a trillion dollars. In US, in US terms, current terms, is what Morgan Stanley is predicting in their mid-range forecast for about 20 years from now. Um, that's what they think is most likely. Their low forecast is 800 uh, billion. Um, so it, this is pretty serious stuff. Well, who of you here is a consumer of space services? Uh, just about everybody should raise their hand and think. Um, if you get GPS, satellite broadband, satellite TV, satellite radio, I've got this antique phone here. This is one that is so old that, the, that Verizon gave this one away for free, I think. But right on here, I've got some uh, satellite communication from this National Weather Service telling me what the Hillsdale weather is. It says there are hazardous conditions coming. <laughs> that kind of stuff. Um, when I was consulting in crop insurance, one of the things that we worked on 
was the use of satellite imagery for doing crop insurance adjustment. You fly a satellite over, over fields, and you can adjust for, you, instead of sending an insurance adjuster, adjuster out to check on damage, you can do it by satellite. That's actually very important, say, in third world or less developed countries, where it's very difficult to get anyone to do this kind of work. Insurance could make a very big difference for, uh, for farmers in, in poorer countries. Well, currently, consumer satellite services are of over $100 billion worldwide and growing. So this is pretty good size. Another important area is, that's that first panel there, my most entry, space launch and uh, space access. Uh, that's a pretty big, that's a growing, a growing area. Johns Hopkins degree, uh, Johns Hopkins University has a master's degree in space studies right now. And as your final project, if you, you, if you do this master's, you build a satellite. Now, I'm not sure if you actually get to launch this satellite or not, but if you have the money, you can just go and hire some, hire one of these firms, and they'll launch your satellite for you. Um, so these are things that are existing. Things that are imminent, but not quite existing yet, include these things here. So the space stations and manufacturing and, and, and this sort of thing. Um, so, it's, so for manufacturing, space offers some very important advantages in manufacturing. Uh, you've got extreme heat and extreme cold, which are readily accessible for industrial processes. You've got microgravity, which is you know, zero gravity, which is very useful for many, many things. Um, if you want to shape perfectly round objects, you've got material and you, want to, you can shape it easy to do there. We avoid sedimentation of mixtures. In, the va in a vacuum, uh, permits getting very pure forms of chemicals, if that's what you're working on. You can move hazardous or environmentally harmful uh, processes, manufacturing processes in space. And solar energy, <coughs> turns out, it's available there even at night. Um, it's available 24-7. So. Now, of course, to do that requires real estate. And so some firms are already setting up to try to provide those kinds of services with habitat and such. So we have space station bases and infrastructure. And uh, then, of course, I've got ideas like mining here. Well, mining is an interest. I'm not sure how that would show up, but there's actually a picture. <laughs> it's pretty dark. Uh, there's a picture of some guys trying to do some space mining and a bunch of equipment there. Um, so, Moon and asteroids are candidates for being mined. Uh, one asteroid that is being considered for mining is projected to, to contain as much gold as it has been mined in all of human history. Now, it's not the gold that they're after. That's a, that's a side product for this one. Um, the main current interest is apparently water, uh, or rock, rock from which water can be extracted. Because if you can extract water, then, first of all, you've got something that's absolutely necessary if humans are going to live in space. You can set up space environments where people can live, set up an ecosystem, and also you can split the hydrogen off and you've got rocket fuel. So water is the key, you can find that. And then there are also kinds of minerals, but that would solve the cost, many of the costs of space development. So, take that slide. Well, there's another picture of some guys back there doing some mining or something. You take my word for it. Um, these companies that are listed here all exist. Um, these, are, these are companies that are, are working. The first four are uh, mining companies. Um, the second and the fourth, I believe, are both working on ideas for mining the moon. The other two are for asteroids. And the two bottom ones are manufacturing firms that are planning on doing space manufacturing. So these are things that actually exist. Um, these are potentials for long-run kind of activity. Um, and we omitted uh, Bigelow Industries, that's an important firm that is actually working on manufacturing space habitats where people could live. So the likely future of the space economy, <coughs> given that we would have, suppose that we have 2% annual growth rate of GDP for the world for the next, for the re remainder of this century. By 2100, and that's, that I should mention, that's less than what the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, proje projects for annual growth rate. 2% annual growth rate would mean that by 2100, the average income of a person in, on Earth is $80,000. And the world will be six to eight times wealthier. Technology is going to be more advanced. Developments are going to be greater than those that my, than my grandmother witnessed. 
we're going to see us moving into space. We're going to have a multi-trillion dollar space economy. Now that's the space economy, but what about space economics? And I want to get in tonight to three different topics where I think economics can, talk, can, can say something. And the first one is development models and the role of the private sector. The second one I'm going to talk about will be development of private property rights in space. And then finally, I'm going to talk about the role of government and what government, what we can think government might be doing. And I think economics has a great deal to tell us on all of these. Um, so let's start out with development models and questions. Somebody realize that I'm talking, but I, if people have questions, then I'll, I'll entertain them as I, as I go. Nobody? There is a quiz at the end, right? <laughs> Why are you laughing? <laughs> anyway, so let's start out with this. There's a couple of pictures of rockets taking off. There's a space shuttle, there's a SpaceX rocket. And they look very similar. It looks, you know, physically, they look very similar. But they represent two entirely different economic approaches. The first one is a centralized approach, and the second is a private property, private, private enterprise approach. And so this is what I want to emphasize, the dip, <coughs> distinction. Quite important. Um, the centralized approach in development models. Who is going to, who's going to be driving space development? Um, the centralized approach is historically the model that has been used. This is, the, this is the approach that was used to get Americans to the moon. On 25th of May, 1961, John F. Kennedy announced Americans would walk on the moon by the end of the, end of the decade. And this whole process is when things are done on a centrally, more or less centrally planned uh, uh, basis. Um, it's government driven. You take a physically defined target or goal. Uh, it organize it from the top down, give orders, tell, tell you know, put contracts out to firms. And in fact, it can work, obviously. We've got man on the moon. The problem with it is that it's not economical. It cannot identify the benefits and the costs of what it's doing. That's economics properly understood. There's a second, uh, a second model for development. That's the decentralized model. Um, the decentralized model is, has a different structure to it. It is entrepreneur, NASA, or who, whomever the space agency is, the government, if government is part of the, part of the story, um, <coughs> is not driving everything. They're simply another customer. So you have private firms. They have relative freedom of entry with, with, uh, with uh, uh, they can, they can entry, enter to compete to solve problems. They find solutions. They private, provide services, try different methods of uh, solving these problems. And the entrepreneurs, in this case, are the risk bearers, unlike in the other situation where NASA or actually the taxpayers are ultimately, ultimately the risk bearers. Um, well, this tends to maximize the net benefits, the benefits that are net of cost. People have an incentive to drive those costs down and get the value up and satisfy the customer. And uh, we do actually have some serious laws that were passed in the United States. We do have a head start in, in some respects on that, on some of the satellite sorts of activities. This is sustainable, economically sustainable. That's long run sustainable. And the world has been moving from the centralized to the decentralized uh, structure. The space shuttle was actually the last big, uh, the big centralized project for the United States. It was supposed to provide easy access uh, to space. Can I get that to Easy access to space, and it was a failure. It was supposed to be cost effective. It was not a cost, cost effective. It was a failure. SpaceX looks like they may have this, uh, this problem solved, as might others. Um, okay. Now, entrepreneurship. Okay, entrepreneurship is got these components to it, and you can say something about it. But, um, it's cost effective. So private launch services are important here. And private launch services, the first, uh, first what, four of those, or all of them, those are American ones, and then Mitsubishi is, a, is fifth. Um, it's a non-exhaustive list of private firms that are providing launch services. Uh, SpaceX is, is providing services for the, for the uh, US Air Force, for NASA, and also for, uh, for private private satellites and such. 
That's, of course, Elon Musk's operation. Uh, Jeff Bezos with uh, uh, Blue Origin is trying to play catch up to him as a challenger. United Launch Alliance is Lockheed Martin and Boeing, a joint venture that they have. They, I think they work entirely under contract with the federal government, but they provide launch services for the Department of Defense and for NASA. And uh, two others. Does anyone know who these other four are on the other side are? Where are they from? They're all from China. Those are four private Chinese firms that provide launch services to the government of, uh, to, not just to the government, but to the, but to the Chinese national uh, space agency. And there are six more. The Chinese understand this. Anybody who's going into space at this point understands that this decentralized model <coughs> is the cost-effective way to do it. Um, it is, oh, I think I have a cute thing that pops up now. Decentralization is inevitable. This is move to the decentralized model. If you're going to be cost effective and make it sustainable, this is what you're going to do. You're going to harness entrepreneurship and market forces in order to do it. And so we're seeing that. That's a prediction from economics, and we seem to be seeing it uh, happen. Anybody who doesn't do this is going to be left behind. The Russians even seem to be catching on to, uh, to this kind of idea. Um, so what we've done so far, we've used some market process theory, some industrial organization, we've used some public choice theory, and the focus here is being on organization on Earth and how the economy functions here. Um, so, questions on that before I switch to the next topic? Yes? Um, so are those four providing incentives for the U.S. government? These four? Mm -hmm. These are all Chinese, and they provide services for the Chinese for the China National Space Agency, and I think they may do some other things too. You could probably, presumably, you could contract with them if you had a satellite and you had the wherewithal to pay them. Just some pictures. These are photographs of the uh, that's commercial resupply service uh, uh, number nine. Um, which was a SpaceX project to resupply the space shuttle. Not the space shuttle, the, uh, to, to resupply the International Space Station. An uh, actual photograph of the launch and then a photograph taken of the, of the capsule coming out. So, interesting. And here's one of, for entertainment's sake, there's one of a, of a one space rocket taking off, Chinese rocket. Private. Um, great. Well, there's, there's interesting interesting to me at least. Let's switch to property rights. And of course we're talking about property rights, private property rights, but quote from one of my favorite economists. And Mises, Ludwig von Mises says that civilization is based on private property rights. I think this is true. Private property is inextricably linked to civilization. And if we're expanding civilization off of Earth, we're going to have private property rights there. Um, and I think that's probably not a surprise to most of the, uh, to a Hillsdale audience. Um, but there's going to be property rights, private property rights in space assets. Okay, put this up here. Um, economics tells us that uh, um, the, pri the private property rights are not going to be optional. There's the massive potential that we have for development requires that we have private property rights. As the benefits of development of space increase and the cost of space access fall, it's going to become increasingly justified to, work, to spend the, do what it takes to develop these property rights. Now, why would that be? Well, again, I don't think it's hard to explain to a Hillsdale audience, but property rights, secure private property rights, are going to be needed if people are going to have the incentive to invest large amounts of capital in these kinds of projects. And these projects will take huge amounts of capital. <laughs> If people are going to commit large investments, they need secure properties. <coughs> also, the idea of this residual claiming with a property rights system, a private property rights system, the person who is best able to generate the most value from a set of assets is the one who is likely to get it. Because if you have an asset and you can't generate much value from it, you can make a great deal by t selling it to someone who can. So, mark, so private property rights uh, with functioning markets generate the maximum value that can be obtained from the available resources out there. So that's 
So we're going to see that sort of thing. And then finally, um, these are crucial on a, on a deeper level to the process that they generate. They generate the entrepreneurial discovery process uh, that is necessary to uh, calculate benefits and costs, uh, to get innovation, experimentation, for developing the kind of knowledge, getting collecting that dispersed knowledge, and uh, making things sustainable, or as we also say, profitable. And that's the Austrian market process there that, derived, that drives civilization. Now, it's kind of interesting because we do already have a current existing institutional framework for property rights in space, and that is the Outer Space Treaty. That is, oh, well, private property rights are inevitable. I forgot to tell you that. <laughs> conveniently popped up. The Outer Space Treaty in 1967 uh, is, is, is crucial here. Was actually, I had a copy of the treaty. I was going to read the full title, but that would take about five minutes. So I probably wouldn't do it anyway. But the Outer Space Treaty in 1967 is signed by the United States, by all of the major space-faring nations, and, and over 100 countries have signed it. But it provides for, oh, I wrote it down here. You don't want to hear this. It's the Treaty on the Principles Governing the Activities of States and the Exploration and Use of Outer Space, including the Moon and other celestial bodies. It covers all of outer space from the standpoint of human ownership. It was proposed by the United States to head off the space race a space race where people were staking claims on things. And it requires common ownership of property and common development of property, quote, for the benefit and in the interests of all countries. It also provides for freedom of access for all countries to any space, any space, any celestial body. Um, state governments, states and governments will have responsibility for the legal responsibility for launches that occur from their territory. It also provides for ownership by, by, by states, presumably, of the infrastructure that is established in space. So if you build something in space, you get to keep it, but you can't claim anything in space that's already there, is basically what the notion is. Um, it also provides that there will be no weapons of mass destruction and no military bases stationed in space, except to the extent that military people are sent up for exploration purposes. Now, a couple of points about it. First of all, the terminology in the, in the treaty is poorly defined. Um, exactly, it doesn't even define where outer space begins. Um, and it's not clear what it means by saying that, uh, that we have uh, open access or that property must be de de sorry, developed for the benefit and interest of all countries. Um, and then secondly, there's no enforcing body for this treaty, and there's no enforcing mechanism. States live in a state of in a, in a, in a, in a state of anarchy with respect to each other, and so either this is self-enforcing, or states will have to find a way to force it on each other, or it won't be won't be enforced. Um, great. Well, that's the that's the governing principle right now. The governing set of institutions. There's another set of institutions that are interesting, and that is the Commercial Space Launch Competitiveness Act of 2015 otherwise known as the Space Act, which some Congress person thought was clever to call the Spurring Private Aerospace Competitiveness and Entrepreneurship Act, is called Space, uh, of 2015. And this does a number of things. It promotes private satellite service. Uh, it promotes uh, private launch services, and it provides go some government insurance for those. But what's most interesting about it, something that's new, is this Title IV of the, uh, of the, uh, of the set of laws. And it provides for mining. And so the question that has been raised is, does this violate the Outer Space Treaty of 1967? Some critics say, yes, it does. Some say, no, it doesn't. And it's unclear. Uh, the, uh, the law itself says, this doesn't violate anything that we, we're, not, we're not going against anything we've already agreed to. Uh, but it certainly provides for US citizens to take stuff, bring it back, and so, asteroids and moon, moon parts and things like this. And uh, so there's some, some question as to what this means. Here's what's going on. Because the previous law is unclear, states are going to be staking out claims and claiming then 
that this is what the what the law means. You're going to be carving this out, and setting this up. We're interpretization, interpretation, and rationalization in the United States is uh, that startup. Uh, the United States is not the only one that is working to divvy up space or to obtain resources here. And here's another, rather than looking at uh, pictures or statements of laws. Uh, this is the Chang Er 4. Uh, actually, actually, it's not the Chang. That's the, that's the rover. The ramps here are from a, a, a Chinese lander, the Chang Er 4, that landed on the far side of the moon, the back side of the moon, on January 3rd of this year. And they dropped this little rover, the Jay Rabbit, which is out now running around and, and doing things. And so this is our exploration. It's the first serious exploration of this kind on the back side of the moon. One of the things that the Chinese are doing is they have put in a lunar micro ecosystem. It's got potato seeds, cotton seeds, grape seed, uh, Aerodopsis thaliana, it's kind of plant, silkworm eggs, fruit fly eggs, and some yeast. And they're trying to build a self-sustaining ecosystem. They want to see if they can, they're going to use, they're using solar energy to heat it, to generate the energy, and then see if they can build a self-sustaining ecosystem. The idea here to this experiment is that eventually you would be able to build an ecosystem that perhaps human beings might live in, with space colonization. You might even be able to grow food. They've got potato seeds. And uh, so they have four more, the Chinese have four more of these, of these uh, uh, missions planned. And uh, one, of the, one, of the, one of these will be scouting for a possible polar base, either a robotic or human-based uh, base. Now the Russians, of course, don't want to be left behind on this. And so they probably have the best approach of all. <laughs> They're training lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, the economists in the room, please get to work. We can't let the law, the law and they're physicists here. Everyone, we can't, we can't let the law be this, whatever. Um, well, space law is actually quite an important area. And this is going to be further developed. But here's a different question. How are property rights going to develop? Because the United States, China, Russia, maybe other countries are going to be trying to staking out claims in, the, uh, in space. And as I've said, states, national governments, are in an anarchic relation with each other. Can economics tell us anything about that? We know that economics tells us we're going to have property rights. Does it tell us anything about how this competition might develop? I think it does, and this is probably the more ten most tenuous part of my talk, but I'll take care. Um, talk a little bit just about this, the economic theory of anarchic relations. This is developed by an economist, Jack Hirschweiger who had done quite a bit of work on conflict theory. He was a new institutional economist, but a very mathematical one. I thought it was nicer to put a picture of the, the book rather than put a bunch of equations up, um, especially in this big praxis. Um, the uh, name for Mises' work. So. Um, let's look at the, a little bit about the new institutional economics of conflict in nation states. And so the way I conceive of this, we've got the United States, we have China, we have Russia, maybe some other countries in competition. And Hirschweiger has a model of theory of anarchic relationships. Uh, when we have multiple players, multiple groups, and they don't have any third party enforcement, and they are competing over potential resources. In his model, first of all, there are no binding contracts. That's the situation we have here. The Outer Space Treaty of 60, 1967 is not a binding contract on anyone. There's no enforcement. Any agreement that ends up existing has to be self-enforcing. The players, the forces have to agree to do it. And in his model, there are two possible activities, and one of them is economic production, and the other one is fighting. Fighting is either predation or defense, but it's, those are the two things you can do. And he develops in his model three kinds of, or two kinds of equilibria, a stable one and then an unstable one. A stable one would be peace, where forces are equally balanced, relatively balanced. 